Okay, thanks so much for joining me here today. Uh, we're here today to talk about AI literacy and how it might come into play when we talk about educating people in the university environment and the grade school environment. So I'm super excited to have you both here with us today. Adam, can you introduce yourself? Yeah, um, my name's Adam. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Alberta. Um, I'm here today to talk about teaching AI to students across campus. So Lon and I are, are introducing this new AI Everywhere course, which is attempting to teach people, a broad swath of people across campus about AI. Yeah, awesome. And Jill, who are you? Yeah, so I'm Jill, um, Jill Kowalczyk. I am the K-12 Education Advisor at Amy. Um, I was a former teacher for seven years. I taught social studies um, junior high and high school. So that's a little bit about my, how, I, how I ended up here to talk about teachers and literacy. And I'm uh, leading the project um, in our K-12 space. So our pilot currently with our high school teachers. Um, I'm also a PhD student at the University of Alberta. Um, in the Faculty of Education, studying curriculum and pedagogy, but more specifically, my research looks at teachers' moral agency in the age of generative AI. Good. So I think that tells us a bit about why each of you are here. So you have a real eye on the K-12 uh, landscape and how AI is already being talked about in schools, how we might integrate it further. And you and I are putting together this new course to try to introduce AI to a broader range of students, not just the students with a super technical background. And part of the reason we want to do that, to introduce students to that AI, those AI concepts, is because we're interested in AI literacy. Yeah, and I think AI literacy means a different thing depending on the group you're talking to. So yeah. what does AI literacy mean to you? So, so when I think of AI literacy, I think about people making decisions in, the, in their own lives and at, at different levels. So like part of those decisions is like how to engage in conversations at the dinner table with your parents, your grandparents, your siblings. Um, and, and I think to do that well, you have to have an understanding of how these things work and, and where the technology is going and also what are its limitations because you watch the media and AI can do this, AI can do that, it's coming for you, it's coming for me. <laughs> and of course the reality is these, these things are, are not like that. Um, and, and so I want people to be able to understand things so they're not afraid and then they can make decisions in their own life, not just conversations, but also is, is AI relevant to my future? Like whether I'm going to be a scientist or an educator or something else, you, you need to know about these things because you need to think about how it might interact with your future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think we have some agreement on that cool. yeah, for sure. Right. I'm like, I'm listening to you and I'm like, yeah, that, that definitely um, speaks to me in terms of what I think AI literacy is. I think it is a lot more nuanced, um, which, you, which you mentioned, than just having a technological understanding of AI. I think how we interact with AI in our everyday lives is super important and how we critically think about kind of what's going on behind the curtain yeah. um, is a huge part of AI literacy. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it, and it's not just for, you know, the typical technical folks, right? Mm -hmm. Like it's for everybody, um, which AI everywhere, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think that's kind of the, the, big, the bigger picture is that it's all encompassing and it's um, speaking to not only the technical uh, competencies, but also more like the social emotional competencies as well. Yeah, I guess that's what I think about too, that I want people to be able to understand the AI in their lives such that they can control it and get mm -hmm. it to do what they want. They, I want people to have AI serve their own uses and rather than sort of it, some other company making a decision about what AI should be for them. I want people to know how AI works enough that they can make it work for them in their lives. And that has many different applications. I mean, it could be your social media, but it could also be at work like or in school. How do I get uh, chat GPT to help me write this essay in a way that's furthering my own learning rather than just pushing me into a non-learning corner. Yeah, I think from like the AI and education standpoint, I would really like to see us move beyond like AI just for tool usage, okay. um, right? Like I would like to see this, you know, this is where we get into this conversation of AI for education versus education for AI is like, how can we actually leverage AI to be not only a tool, but like a partner in the mm -hmm. educational process and work alongside or in a collaborative way with the AI um, when teachers bring it into the classroom? Yeah, I've seen that already in my students that they are um, using the uh, the chatbots like ChatGPT for like an office hours of sorts. So mm -hmm. like they have a question about the material and before they, you know, take the time to come to my actual physical office, they'll just, you know, put it into ChatGPT and see where it gets them. And if they feel like they have a better understanding and it jives with what we've talked about in class, then, you know, that might be, you know, enough for what they need or it might sort of help them to, to help them to formulate their questions for when they come into office hours. 
Yeah, and I think that can work all the way down. Of course, you can correct me because I'm just speaking from my imagination mostly. But, you know, we, we talk about education and how we have a bad imbalance of teachers versus number of students in the classrooms mm -hmm. these days. And, yeah. uh, and, and one of the problems is that there are special needs children. There are, there are children that are way ahead of the course. Mm -hmm. And thinking about how AI can help us tailor the educational experience to, to all the different groups of students, I think is like a wonderful thing. And, and it's a conversation, not just a bot telling a student facts because right. Google can already do that. Yeah. yeah, and those are like those are great examples of AI for education, yeah. right? Where I'm getting this kind of differentiation between um, the two education for AI versus AI for education is like we see um, in a lot of the pol national policy documents and strategies that have come out, the mention of education is often in very specific terms that talk mm -hmm. about like economic competitiveness of a nation, as opposed mm -hmm. to talking about um, what you just mentioned in terms of the um, supports that yeah. can be offered and the personalized learning opportunities that AI can provide. Yeah. Um, the other side, this education for AI is about educating people to be a part of a workforce, mm -hmm. right? Or making sure that there are enough computer science or uh, specialists in the future um, to be able to move this field forward, but not thinking necessarily about the kiddos that are in the classrooms right now. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I think is really interesting from all of the, the national uh, strategy documents that have been released thus far. And if maybe I could just add one more thing onto that. And this is like, I'm remembering really old research from like the early 90s about this, but there's there's been this interesting question about, you know, when we think of modern AI technology, it's like this pre-trained artifact that's deployed in the world and it's like static fixed. It doesn't It doesn't actually really change very much once it's out into the world. And of course, we know that anything that's unchanging can be wrong, and then you might want to change it and update it. That, that's one view of how these technologies works. But I think in the educational context, and just in general, in the cooperative mindset, you know, AI systems can learn from interacting with people. Mm -hmm. and, and actually, I think that's a more powerful educational tool to think about mm -hmm. AI systems that learn to do an activity with people. And so there's like old research about AI systems learning to solve the same problem that say a child is in an educational context and then both getting better together to to have a better learning outcome i think that's i think that's something we need to think more about going forward mm -hmm. and like hyper personalization for education like my daughter loves minecraft but some of her friends are really into soccer and so could you have an ai that used examples from those particular things to illustrate other concepts like maybe physics mm -hmm. you know and then it would be more interesting to each one of the students if it had that sort of personalization yeah and i think when we're talking about back to this idea of ai literacy that the teachers need to have a special degree of ai literacy mm -hmm. that's maybe separate from the students in some ways. So like that critical thought process, and I know we're gonna talk a little bit more about value alignment later, but um, what part of my job and my research is thinking about how can we support teachers' AI literacy development so that they can better support students and how does that look different? Because there's a lot of fear. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I did a sort of an evening session with some teachers and they you know, expressed a lot of concern about if students aren't writing anymore how will they learn to think and and so you know finding a way to integrate a tool into the classroom in a way that doesn't interfere with learning outcomes like we still want our students to be able to write we still want our students to be able to think through writing and so how can we you know do both of these things at the same time yeah I, I read this really interesting piece lately and i the author's name is escaping me right now but it was um advocating or he was advocating for a bilingualism of mm -hmm. sorts um, with AI and education. So teaching kiddos how to use these tools mm -hmm. and like what's going on behind the scenes, but not throwing away yeah. the pen and paper, not throwing away the traditional forms of education that we know work and the traditional pedagogy and instructional strategies that we know are be best practice in education. Um, and so I think from my work with teachers as well, like that's something that I'm seeing is that we have teachers on both sides of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Like there isn't a bilingualism, right? They're, they're not meeting in the middle. There's either the folks that are like, no, pen and paper only, no tech in my classroom, mm -hmm. or it's the complete adoption of tech. And then it's like, yo, they don't need those skills anymore. Mm -hmm. So I'm very much um, a proponent of that middle ground. Mm -hmm. I think it's also to 
important to like step back and realize that although this is a transformative technology and, and things are changing very quickly and it makes people worried and upset, you know, the, the history of things is that this happens over and over and over. We don't have to look too far back to look at the internet. When I was in high school, the internet was not really a thing. Mm -hmm. By the end of university, it was a big thing in, in my educational experience. And you can go all roll the clock further and further back. Like I was reading The Great Train Robbery and he was talking about how England was revolutionized overnight when cities arose, right? And it just fundamentally turned life upside down for every single person in the country, right? Going from rural to urban environments. And so we've been through these disruptive changes and it's just important to take a historical view of it and say, this is, this is a little bit messy, this is concerning, it's scary, but, but you know, we'll get through it like we usually do. Yeah, and I think if you had asked me around this time last year when, when ChatGPT was very new, like where we would be now a year later, I would have had, I would have thought there would have been more impact sort of like on jobs, but it, it does seem to have happened a bit slower. And I think that's also for, par for the course that we have these ideas that things will change so quickly. And, uh, you know, people have their own inertia. Things take a little while. Yeah, and I think, you know, these things are often accelerated by, um, the media wanting to inflate and excite people like that's mm. that's kind of how they operate but but on the other hand also the the researchers that drive it get really really excited about their own research and the potential of their own research and sometimes they're not as careful as they could be talking to the general public about it because they convey their broad view and vision of the future and then people interpret that as that's tomorrow yeah mm. and i and i think that's what confuses the narrative a little bit too i mean i think some jobs have changed already like i think of i i'm not a computer programmer in industry anymore but I was at one point and I think people are in industry are using you know code generating chatbots now and their their jobs have changed yeah. but their jobs haven't disappeared and I guess that was sort of the thing that I was most worried about but I mean yeah as you said things change all the time mm -hmm. yeah. and, and I think this change in particular is really good for someone who like myself who advocates for like a total reform of the education system yeah, totally. a lot of the time. Yeah. Tell me right? more about like, this reform, <laughs> <laughs> a total reform. Like this is, but I think going back to the personalized learning thing, mm. right? Like that, I think this era of particularly generative AI yeah. is going to completely transform the way that teachers assess students, the things that we're assessing, mm -hmm. right? And I don't know what that's going to mean for, you know, standardized testing and these different models that we use, but... I'm hoping that it's a change for the better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there are just many aspects of our society right now where I would say we're under-resourced. Like we, we don't have teachers, we don't have nurses, we don't have people to do really important jobs or at least they're way overworked. And thinking about how we can empower those people, remove stress in their lives, make better outcomes in what they do. Like I think that's something that we can all get excited about while also worrying about you know the, the ways that might not be done well. Mm -hmm. yeah. So what is values alignment when we talk mm -hmm. about AI and education? What does that mean? So something that I'm hearing a lot in the education space and from the teachers that I'm working with is they're looking at AI like an agent. And I know that term has a lot of different connotations in the computer science space. I've seen people argue about what is an agent versus what isn't. Mm -hmm. But overwhelmingly in the literature that I'm reading, the teachers that I'm working with, even if we're talking about something like ChatGPT, it's this idea of bringing an external agent, like a third entity, if you will, between you know the student, the teacher, and the AI into the classroom. And then teachers trying to figure out what kind of values does that agent, that entity, bring into the classroom? And how do I pedagogically align myself with that? Right, like there are certain um, applications and things in school boards that are not approved because they don't align for one of the reasons with a particular value that could be like privacy or something, mm -hmm. right? But teachers also have deep like pedagogical values that go beyond student privacy and data security. And so how do we know, is it even possible to know what the developers' minds were like in terms of aligning their values when they built this thing. Mm -hmm. And so how do we measure that? It's a really tough question because there's no universal agreement on any moral values. Right. So if we say something's ethical, to whom is yeah. it ethical? You said something interesting there. You said the teachers aligning their value to the AI. Mm -hmm. Where we usually think of it the other way, mm -hmm. like AI developers think of trying to get AI to have the values of you know, people. So. 
Yeah. Why, why did you phrase it that way? Is that really what you meant? Yeah. 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 Aligning our values with it. And I think, yeah, that, that is what, what people are talking about. How do I align my values? So it's just the same as if you were inviting um, a guest speaker into your classroom, right? You're going to want to make sure that your values are aligned with theirs. So maybe it's more of a mutual aligning of values than it is one-sided for teachers, if that makes sense. Good. And sort of maybe finding that middle ground between yeah. you and a, an, a, another agent, whether it be a, you know, an AI or a speaker. Yeah, yeah. And I don't know if the answer is all of our values need to align in order for me to bring that into the classroom. But how much or how many of those values need to align? Right. And like understanding also where they don't align and mm -hmm. making sure everyone's aware of like, you know, chat GPT is not always truthful if that's a or factual and if that's a value of mine factualness is very important to me. And I know that sometimes ChatGPT can say things that aren't true. Yeah. Making sure everybody knows that. that yeah. We have to make sure that we check what ChatGPT says. Yeah, exactly. One of the teachers that I'm working with, he, he said something really interesting about why are we even bothering or why are AI developers, scientists, researchers trying to align AI with human values when humans are inherently flawed <laughs> and our values are not universal? Mm -hmm. Is, doesn't it seem like an exercise in futility mm -hmm. to try to do that? It's true, but I, I, didn't think, have an I think AI out of the box is so unaligned that like moving it slightly closer to whatever the mean like human value set is, the average value set is, is probably the right thing to do. Um, but you're right that people disagree on lots of things. I mean, we see it all the time in you know political debates. There's people have different ideas about what we should do, what is right. And we can't expect AI to, to be aligned with everybody at the same time. Yeah, and I think that's why for education, it's such a hot topic, right? Like education is deeply political. Yeah. Um, and so it's, <laughs> so it's, <laughs> yeah, yeah it's, it's something that needs to have some, some discussion around, I think. I, I think this topic is really fascinating because um, it's really shaped by how uh, a person approaches what they think the AI is. Mm -hmm. So if, if you think of it as like, a tool or a, a fancy way to make a query system with whatever's known on the internet or written on the internet, it, it's, it's much more related to something like uh, Wikipedia, where I think people are pretty comfortable saying, yeah, some of the Wikipedia articles are bad, or they say like morally bankrupt things, and, and, and you deal with it kind of after the fact or on the fly. But as, but as soon as we start thinking about our AI systems as having personhood or, or agency, it's different because then it's exactly like you said, inviting a guest speaker where you're not going to correct the guest speaker on the fly and, and you'd be worried that there'd be too much to talk about after the guest speaker left if they gave a lecture on some terrible point of view that you know you just spend the next couple of weeks talking about, well, okay, let's talk about why that was bad and then the students are wondering why you invited them and it's all very, very confusing. So I think it's fascinating. It's, it's what, so to speak, values we ascribe onto that system, mm -hmm. whether it's a simple piece of technology or this entity, this agent, as you said. I, I think that's neat because it definitely changes how I think about it. When we talk about values alignment in the context of AI, I think we mean something different. And I kind of touched on it just now, but that we think about how to change AI to be more human or at least to, to not be evil, whatever that means. And, and I think we should be um, honest and say that that is a subfield of AI research, and yeah. a lot of AI researchers have a goal of building a, a system that can achieve a goal or do something efficiently or, or something like that, and they really aren't thinking very much about values and that other people typically come behind them and say, how do I understand this thing? Mm -hmm. How do I know that it has the right values, human alignment? And I, I think that's probably something that is going to continue to change. Yeah, I was just thinking, like, do you think that's the right way to do it? Do you think, like, this silo of I'm making AI and here's some over pe other people over here who are making AI ethical? Like, is that... It, it seems really dangerous as an afterthought. Mm -hmm. So, like, I, I heard an interview with a fairly famous um, AI scientist. I won't say who it was, but, you know, they're, they're very much now worried about AI and, and its impact on the world. And the interviewer asks a very pertinent question, which is like, well, you've been working on this for a long time. Why are you only worried about this now? And the answer was, well, it was kind of science fiction before. I didn't think it actually was possible. Um, I'm not comfortable with that answer because it's, it's, 
it's, it's strange to say I was going to kick the can down the road because I didn't really think we'd get anywhere. And now we are somewhere and now we're doing it after the fact and we're playing catch up. It, it, it seems yeah. strange. Yeah. And I, but I think also more people, even if they are just interested in, you know, making something more efficient, at least now they're also aware of some of those issues. And I think it's really relevant for this conversation when we talk about um, partnerships and, and learning together and things like that, that it's really when AI and humans come together that these things are really important. So whether it's using human data or querying or interacting with people, because, you know, on a previous version of this podcast, Mike Bowling came and talked about agents that play Atari. Playing Breakout and playing Breakout really, really well, it's hard to see where we're worried about value alignment there. But mm -hmm. when we have, you know, intelligent tutors that are learning with children, that that really matters mm -hmm. and should be designed from the ground up thinking about these things. And yeah. I think I think that's where it's it's really difficult right now because you have smaller startup companies that are building these models and they're running with the, the typical, you know, move fast and break things model, which is very dangerous. And then you have the much larger tech companies that are being more cautious because they're worried about stock price. Right. And so this one is actually driving the behavior of, of everyone yeah. and the tech companies are moving slower, but it's still this weird situation that I think we need to have a broader conversation about. To me, it sounds like there also needs to be some like interdisciplinary cooperation, if you exactly. will, yeah. um, especially if we're thinking about like teachers as user designers, like how many of these educational AI assistants have actually consulted teachers yeah. at all. Yeah. I think that is a problem. I don't yeah. know the answer to that. Maybe they have. But um, knowing that even things like ChatGPT are going to be used in the educational space, it seems like teachers should have been consulted in that conversation. Yeah. And so like, how can we all work together to ensure that this AI literacy, ethics being a component, value alignment being a component is actually realized? One more thing to consider when we bring AI into the classroom is the idea that as we allow technology to do some of the cognitive things that we used to do, we might get worse at those things. So my personal example is, well, I mean, you might just think of your phone. My phone is full of phone numbers. Mm -hmm. When I was a child, I knew multiple phone numbers by heart. <laughs> yeah. My both, I mean, my home phone number, of course, which I still know by heart, but also all my friends and, you know, because I had to dial them da daily possibly to talk to my friends. But now I know like two phone numbers and that's it. One of them's mine. <laughs> you know, so like how uh, so much of my, I, and I found in other areas too, that my memory has definitely gotten worse because I have, you know, technology that can act as memory for me. So how might ChatGPT and these language models or AI in the classroom also affect skills? <laughs> it's, it's interesting because this exact question comes up in computer science. So in computer science, you know, there's there's different ways to interact with the computer and we call it computer programming we, we write code. And there's different types of programming languages. There's the, the ones that people use nowadays, which is called Python, everyone loves it, it's great. Then there are, there are languages that are much closer to the way the machine works. We call it machine code and the level above that is called assembly language. And, and basically the short answer is, Almost no one can understand it. It's extremely low level, but you could you could write the most efficient code if you work that way. I never have to worry about that. And I haven't had to worry about it since I was mm -hmm. an undergrad and I took a course in it. Mm -hmm. But the reason I took a course in it is because at my university, they thought it was important for me to know how machine code worked so that I could think about it when I do other aspects of being a computer scientist. Mm -hmm. And and so I think I think we get to choose how we build our education in the future. And we can make decisions like that. Like your example with cell phone, my example is uh, basic arithmetic. Calculators and my phone, I'm really bad at basic arithmetic. That's definitely my fault. Um, <laughs> but I think as educators, we need to think about, okay, it is important to teach machine code. It isn't important to do this other thing. And we have to constantly think about this, this question about what are the relevant things that we think we should still be good at? Because we do hope that eventually that some things become basically, you know, well understood enough that we don't worry about them anymore unless you're an expert in that low level thing so that we can, you know, learn about the world at a, at a much higher level. If we taught all of human understanding back to when we were striking stones together to make fire, we would have way more than 12 grades <laughs> and, and we don't cover a lot of stuff that is now just assumed knowledge. But, but it is an interesting question of what we decide to cover and what we don't. And, and my example of 
uh, you know, machine code is very controversial, even in my own home department. People are like, no, we should never cover that. That's dumb. Mm-hmm. And other people are like, that's one of the most important things. Mm-hmm. So, I think it's also really important to recognize that these cognitive extensions, um, whether that's a pen and paper or a math manipulative or a calculator, sh- actually changes the way that we think, the process of thinking. The way that you think with a pen in your hand, able to write something down, is very different than the way that you think when you don't. And so I think there needs to be a, a deeper conversation too about what AI as a collaborative partner or how it changes the way that we think. Mm-hmm how it changes the way that students think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm all for the, the outsourcing of some of our cognitive tasks to free up space for other things. Yeah. But I don't think that AI should be considered on the same level as a calculator. When I've seen many people make that argument, <laughs> that this is the same as ChatGPT is the same as when calculators w- were introduced. Yeah. Um, not really, because calculators are like pretty understandable to the human mind of how they're operating. And we can, by ourselves, do that on a piece of paper if we yeah. wanted to. Yeah. But with AI, that isn't the case for mm-hmm. most folks. Yeah. The writing example is beautiful because I, I th- think about algorithms and experiments I want to run. And I sit there and think for a while, like, yeah, that's really clear. That's a good idea. And then I pull up my research journal and I start writing about it. And then I realize, oh, that's not clear at all. And there's a bunch of steps missing. And I, I actually don't have a clear idea here. And like you're right, this, this, this role of thinking through writing is like, I think, a really fundamental thing. And I think it would be bad if it was gone. Right. But maybe thinking as writing can become thinking as a conversation with mm. an AI agent. And yep. it doesn't have to, like the process of writing is not the the key, the process, the important thing is that iterative That's nature, right. that sort of like back and forth and thinking through step by step. And we learn to do it with pen and paper. That's right. And I think students will learn to do it in a different way. Well, and we're seeing that even before this AI literacy, but with digital literacy mm-hmm. in education. There are so many advocates that advocate for, um, you know, getting rid of the paper and pencil for certain kiddos that that doesn't serve them. Like mm-hmm. as a teacher, I saw that often. Yeah. Kids can't get their thoughts down on paper sometimes. And so if it's a conversation that they need to have with me in order to achieve assessment or right. what have you, that's reasonable. Or if they need to make a podcast or a YouTube video in order to get their understanding across, mm-hmm. I think that's a totally valid um, rhetorical form mm-hmm. that students can present. And I think AI just offers more opportunities for kids to be able to express themselves through different rhetorical means. Mm -hmm. And it's that iteration, right? Like even in the process of making a YouTube video, you might make part of it and then realize part of it's not good and go back and forth. And the process of getting from an idea to a final form, like that's what helps you think. And it doesn't necessarily have to be writing in Mm -hmm. particular, Mm -hmm. like the actual physical writing. Yeah. But I do think it's still a skill we should teach. We try to teach <laughs> writing on paper. Yes. Yeah. Because <laughs> who knows? You yeah. might have to do it someday. <laughs> I, I like the, the comment that, that Joe made about the calculator and that we can understand it because I think there is a progression that we're going to have to make about not perfectly understanding these AI systems, or at least not everyone. And mm-hmm. so all of us have probably got on a plane this year, and um, part of the takeoff and landing of that plane is done by for all intents and purposes, an AI system. You know, it, it controls things on the plane. I don't think any of us understand how that works, yet we trust it. Um, yeah. And, and there's, there's lots of examples like that out in the world. And so it is part of the story of trusting things we don't perfectly understand. Hopefully, there exist people that do understand those systems, and that's definitely true of the autopilot. Mm-hmm. Um, but not everyone will, and we have to be comfortable with that, I think. And I think like we get into cars all the time and and it used to be when you moved your wheel, it was physically connected to the actual wheels of the car. That's Mm -hmm. not true anymore. Mm -hmm. But we have the mental sort of structure. We have the the metaphor in place that I move my wheel and it moves the wheels of the car. And, you know, that's not a physical connection anymore. It's an electronic connection. But we understand it enough to act as if it was a physical connection. And maybe... Um, understanding AI in a similar way, like there is no, I don't know what this physical connection would be in that metaphor, but like understanding AI enough to be able to control it is really what gets me excited. And it's why I thought this AI Everywhere course was so important. People need to be able to understand AI enough to get it to do what they want it to do, Mm -hmm. you know, for their own personal lives, but also in their jobs, because AI is going to become part of jobs 
in, in a more serious way integrated right. into workflows. I also wanted to mention that I think AI in the classroom also opens up an interesting opportunity for students to act as a curator mm -hmm. rather than necessarily a, a creator. So when I was you know, going through my grade schooling, there wasn't a lot of opportunity to read bad writing and think about why it was bad. Like most of the writing we were exposed to was either like our own writing, surely bad, <laughs> but you know, sometimes it's hard to see, or the writing done by professionals, right? Mm -hmm. And there was no opportunity to see that, you know, writing that's not great and how could I make it better? Sort of, I didn't feel like that was part of the process, but working with an AI, I think, opens up an interesting opportunity. Like I often have the um, situation where I ask ChatGPT to write something for me and it's bad. And then I ask it to refine it. And this is this process of, of me helping ChatGPT to make the writing something closer to what I was envisioning. Mm -hmm. And I think that that sort of ability to see when writing is good and bad is also something that comes with interacting with AI. Do you have any thoughts on that? <laughs> I feel like my experience in education, I did try to expose students to different types of writing, maybe not necessarily like bad writing, <laughs> but different types of writing. Um, and I do see value in what our learning kits that we built here at Amy for the K-12 pilot um, really focus on is like critical thinking with mm. AI. Mm. So plugging something into ChatGPT and then refuting it or defending it. Right. Um, and I think that's a really valuable skill for kids to have with AI literacy. Um, you were speaking about earlier, mm. university students um, maybe running something through ChatGPT before they come to your op office hours, right? And if we can prepare students with skills to be able to do that and, and critically think about AI mm. before they get to university, post-secondary, the workforce, I think that's going to be a huge, a, a huge bonus. Yeah, and also, I mean, the process of being critical of AI also maybe helps you to be critical of other yeah. things in your life. Because I think also, I, I did a lot of my education without learning to question the things I was being taught. Mm -hmm. I remember one of my very first moments where my teacher said something in class where I was like, that's false. That's not true. And it was this mind-blowing thing where I was like, teachers can be wrong, <laughs> yeah. you know? But if we're teaching our students to think about whether the AI is right or not, maybe they will also take those, you know, critical eyes into other areas of their lives. Well, and that's the hope, right? To have some type of critical AI literacy, I think is what I would advocate for, just like right. critical digital or media literacy, right? right? And I think AI can support that, but it also presents challenges with like making it more difficult for students to discern, especially younger kids who might not have been exposed to things like deep fakes yeah. um, before, which adds a whole different layer into the media literacy piece. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's so important. My daughter learned to fact check in like third grade. Yeah. She learned to get three sources online and yeah. make sure that and like YouTube videos don't count as sources. And she had, like, it was pretty amazing. It's great that they're teaching that. Mm -hmm. So important. So tell me about what is the rubber stamp phenomenon? So this idea that we as humans are just essentially going to become the rubber stampers of decisions made by AI. So this is definitely follow, falling into the moral agency piece. Yeah. Um, and what I'm really interested in is like, yeah, to what extent are we just rubber stamping the recommendations that AI is making that is exercising some limited degree of moral agency, but I would argue it's not the same as, you know, full moral agency. Um, and so what kind of problematics can that, um, or what kind of problems can that bring forth? But I think it also speaks to what we need to teach kids, again, about AI so that they don't just become those rubber stampers are there things that it's okay that we're just the rubber stamp versus what isn't? Yeah. What should we be more engaged with? So do you have an example of either where we should or should not be a rubber stamp? Yeah, I, I, the one example that um, I was recently reading was about like social welfare, actually. Hmm. So if we just become, um, if somebody is accused of like fraud on the basis, on, by an AI, yeah. through a social welfare system and we just say okay like that could potentially leave, lead to devastating consequences mm -hmm. in education i haven't necessarily seen this play out in real life but a lot of our standardized tests i think kind mm -hmm. of do this in mm -hmm. a way 
a one-time assessment of a student's ability I don't think is a good picture of what that student is actually capable of. But sometimes those one-time assessments are used in a way that is going to harm them in the future. Yeah. And I think also there's a movement away from using GREs to decide who gets into grad school because sometimes that's a useful tool, but often, I mean, you, again, it's a one-time test. It's a rubber stamp on your performance. It's not always indicative of your overall aptitude. Yeah, and, and I think this comes back to this this idea of just making everyone more critical and, and engaging with things. So like my example of a rubber stamp I wanna keep is spam filtering. <laughs> that's a machine learning system that's been working well for a long time, things get through. Sometimes you have to check your spam filter, but by large it works pretty well. Um, and, and then on, on the other extreme, I work a lot in industrial control and applying AI to industrial control. And so you go talk to plant operators and they tell you how you know, the engineers came in and they made some predictive model of the system. And when the plant was first commissioned, it works really, really well actually. Like it tells them how to control the plant. It's very efficient. But plants change over time because pumps and motors and things change and things break down. And so the whole system drifts away from, from the model. Mm. And so it stops working and the operators just stop trusting it. And then mm. eventually they just never open what the model says anymore because they have assessed kind of in real time, this thing is no longer a useful decision support tool. And so I, I, I like the idea of teaching kids, yeah, let's, let's be critical about things. Let's ask the question, are they working? Are they doing the right things? Because I think that's one way to deal with this rubber stamp thing is to say some things you can trust and let's talk about those things you can trust. Other things we should always be skeptical of. And just like if you were working with another person, they're like, let's turn this pump up to a thousand. Like, whoa, Joe, what did you have for coffee this morning? <laughs> no way, right? Like the more we can turn it into critical thinking and conversations is great, I think. How does the AI Everywhere class that we're making think about AI literacy? From from my perspective, the the... The first pillar of AI literacy that, that we're going for in this class is just how do these things work? Mm -hmm. Like what, what's really going on? What data is going into these systems? How does the data shift around the system to come to the output that says, yes, this is a cat or there's going to be a forest fire over here? Because I, I just think that it's so important that if we can give people an understanding from a certain level that this is how they work, it'll, it'll be a lot easier to talk to them about what are the concerns should be, and where these systems are just not going to be useful right now. Because I, I think those are the things that are missing from the conversation. There's just this broad narrative that AI, AI is doing all the things and is going to replace all the people. And, and the reason that that narrative works is because people don't understand. And when you don't understand something, you're naturally going to be afraid of it. And so my big passion in this course is help people understand so that they don't have to be afraid. I think that's, that's the first thing to do. Mm -hmm. And I want people to be able to understand AI to make it do what they want. That's right. So that they're not sort of at the mercy of the AIs in their lives. And also so that they they don't become a rubber stamp. So they understand when they should question what should be the red flags. And also when they see a red flag, like why? Yeah. Why is this AI all of a sudden doing something I didn't think it should do? Why did it give me this answer and be able to dig in and figure out what happened? Because it might tell them something more about the situation or it might tell them something more about the AI. And those are both important. Okay. How about... AI literacy in K-12? Yeah, so we're really focusing on teachers, AI literacy, um, and equipping them with the skills that they need uh, to be able to better educate students about AI, and largely what you both have just said um, in terms of thinking critically about AI, and, and so they can use it as a, as a tool, but also um, work alongside it as a collaborator to ultimately change their or transform the educational experience that they're having or students are having. Our program really focuses on starting with a technical, baseline technical understanding of AI and then working into more nuanced conversations around ethics um, and a lot of things that we talked about here today because those are really the conversations that teachers want to have. So we're trying to figure out how to balance how much technical understanding they need to have in order to have these more nuanced conversations about ethics and value alignment and things like that. Good. And so what is that pilot? 
We are working with um, high school teachers right now. We have about 62 of them across school boards um, that are working with us. Um, we had some stakeholder engagement sessions with them um, to ask these questions. What are you interested in learning about? What kind of resources could Amy provide you to teach you about AI so you can teach your students about AI? Um, and we came up with this idea to create learning kits. So we created these digital learning kits that have like assessment resources and lesson plans and everything like that for teachers to utilize in their classrooms um, and then report back to us. So we're in the pilot right now. Had some really positive feedback at our, our midpoint evaluation. And then in the spring, we'll be um, starting pilot with elementary and junior high. Um, so working our way back. Yeah, yeah. super cool. Thank you guys both so much for coming in. I'm super excited for our class next semester, the AI Everywhere. It's gonna be it's gonna be a ride. I'm looking <laughs> forward to it. And also the K through 12, as somebody who has a kid, two kids now in K through 12, I'm so excited you're doing that work. It's so important. And I look forward to my children benefiting from it sometime soon and all, all children at Edmonton. Um, thank you so much for coming on. Uh, and yeah, look forward to seeing how these things play out. Thank you. Thanks, Any, Yeah. Thanks.